Hello, Robs. We're back with So the Witch Won't Eat Me. Fantasy and the Child's Fear of Infanticide by Dorothy Block. I believe this is chapter eight. Could be wrong. Let me look. Yeah, chapter eight. I believe we're at this spot right here. If not, forgive me. By the following day, she was again ready to take it all back. Today, I look upon it as fantasy when Miss Block tells me that my feelings are normal and I have such a paranoid re reaction. I wonder what she means by normal. For a slug that has lived under a rock, an absence of coloring is normal. Fish that live at the bottom of the sea are also normally blind. I wonder if she means that I've responded in a normal way to the conditions of my life and have emerged with the predictable distortions. Her gradual absorption of the concept that she was all right led her to accept not only her feelings of rage, but also other people's, especially Ada's. And for the first time, she allowed herself uninhibited expression of her hatred of Ada. She was then amazed to receive an affectionate note from Ada. After the shock wore off, she answered in the same spirit, but then noted the surprising development. I keep having all kinds of dreams about women. Every woman I've ever known, it seems, is coming back to impress me with her goodwill. On Monday night, my mother and my sister brought me flowers. They're all very happy affairs, except when I wake up, I walk around in a dull rage. Can it be that my rage is my response to being loved? For the first time in weeks, I abandoned all interest in my diet. I felt I had lost. That seems curious. What had I lost? It seems I had need to feel hated. It may be if I feel loved, then I've lost my case. That's what I've lost. I have no justification for my hatred. Another thought occurs. If anybody finds me lovable, then my mother stands convicted. She hated me just because she hated me. That concept led to an understanding of a major part of her struggle. Her journal states, It seems unbearable to me that I just wasn't loved and that nothing I can do will ever change it. That the major protagonist in all of this has been dead now for some years seems to make little difference. There must be something wrong with me. I can still change, and then all will be well. I'll be loved. The thought that I'm all right which at first seems so filled with promise, transforms all hope into empty desolation. At moments I find myself poised as though on the brink of discovery. Perhaps there really is something wrong and Miss Block is concealing it from me. The hope that springs up at such times is my only measure of what's really wrong. During my analysis, I'm aware of having pursued a fixed idea that there was some secret, some mystery, which once revealed would transform my entire life. What I searched for was the weakness in myself that made me unloved. It suddenly occurs to me that the secret has been found at last, and I am refusing to acknowledge it. The secret that there was nothing wrong with me, only that I was unloved. I've really found the key to my life. That was a milestone in Norma's analysis and led her to review the history of her struggle. She wrote... What a difficult time it's been and how much has been accomplished to have identified at last the longing that never had a name or a dimension, but enveloped my spirit in a boundless desolation from the beginning of time. I never knew what I lacked nor what I wanted, but wondered blindly. Oh no, I'm on fucking portrait view or landscape view. I never knew what I lacked nor what I wanted, but wandered blindly over completely unmarked terrain, simply in search. I stumbled often and often had the feeling of returning to something already familiar, to places I thought I had left, but I recognized no guidepost. And all that I came to know was confusion and despair for which I had no label. That this was a hunger for which my experience had given me no definite Definition hadn't occurred to me. I felt the emptiness, the sense of a void, but I didn't know why it was there, perhaps even that it was. 
I called it despair, desolation, hopelessness, but without understanding what hope had been eclipsed to give me to give rise to such a feeling. This is the confusion that has beset me all my life. Finally, to understand it, to know when the feeling is upon me, what it means, however black the despair, is to have restored to me some small measure of human dignity, to have found the beginning of my identity, that I never knew my mother's love, but spent my life in a blind search, unaware that it was missing or even that I searched. Suddenly, this brings into focus so much of my experience. I always feared homosexual feelings. They meant to me that I was unnatural, that I had an affliction, a disease with which I had been born. I think I believed this even when I knew such feelings are shared by all of us, even while I defined them to myself as a search for identity, a longing for acceptance by members of my own sex. And even while I acknowledged that I feared women and had experienced rejection at their hands, that still didn't mean to me that I had never known my mother's love or that my homosexual feelings expressed my wish to find it. The fantasy, however, was not so easily abandoned. Sometime later, she became aware that she identified with her father and again returned to the conviction of her abnormality. When I again exposed her determination to believe there was something wrong with her, she became aware once more of the intensity of her need to cling to the hope that in reality there was something wrong, that she loved, that she could change, and in doing so still qualify for her mother's love. The despair into which she sank finally laid bare her monumental preoccupation with establishing her worthlessness in order to explain her mother's wish to kill her and to keep alive the hope that if she could make herself more worthy, she would be loved. Her new dramatic insight into this investment soon led her to reassess and determinate her relationship with Ada. She recorded the event as follows. I have at last relinquished my desperate attachment to the image of my mother as the source of all love, of salvation. I recall Friday's session when I stated that I was through with Ada and her jealousy, which allowed no room for my growth. And Miss Block had asked insistently, how can you give her up when you have nobody else? I replied with conviction, I can, I have you. I didn't recognize it then, but that was a milestone, my declaration of independence, of a preoccupation which had kept me tethered to all the destructive experiences of my past and made it the inevitable condition of the present. It seems nothing short of a miracle. I have come through out of the dark tunnel. I can't describe the feeling of being here at this moment in full possession of my faculties, my life for the first time stretching ahead of me no longer absorbed in the backward glance. The lengthening chain, the past. I literally feel I've been born, not an infant birth, but into being. I ascribe this final definition of myself to my parting from Ada. When I put her out of my life, I was born at last. With one stroke, I got rid of Danny, of my mother, and of that dreadful image of myself as a creature without shape or form, a female Caliban doomed to live out her life in darkness and mire. And there I was, like the Lady of the Legends, or Papa Gina, who needed only love to disclose her true identity. For the first time in my life, I think I know who I am. Until this point, Norma's analysis had dealt mainly with her need to feel loved and her response to feeling hated. After she had succeeded in experiencing her rage and had established the beginnings of her real identity, she began to feel and to define the terror that lay beneath her unyielding preoccupation with winning love. Although there had been some earlier intimations of it in relation to her creativity and to her sexual activity, her terror did not emerge full-blown until she became interested in, interested in finding a man. Norma's unconscious perception of an important requirement, not only for qualifying for her mother's love, but as her early magical thinking had led her to conclude, for staying alive had been the exclusion of men from her life. Her earliest recollection of the origin of this conviction was at around the age of four and a half and concerned her father. Norma had written about him. It's likely my father was never more than a shadow, which had certain outlines that I filled in out of a need for something solid. Two early memories of him that also involved her mother, however, suggested that the reduction of the early flesh and blood image of her father 
to a mere shadow was the result of a complex process that her mother had set in motion. She described the first one as follows. I was playing on the floor. My brother and sisters had already left for school, not far from the sounds of my mother busily getting the day's cooking underway and dimly aware of my father standing with his back to me, putting on his trousers when suddenly he sprang around and there dangling in front of a kind of pink glow was his thing. I nearly burst with joy as I squealed delightedly. Shame, shame. Grown-ups could be so careless. He quickly tucked the offending member out of sight, blushing with embarrassment and pleasure. Suddenly, my mother burst in upon us, her round belly quivering with a rage that seemed to travel to the very tip of the woody wooden cooking spoon that she seemed to brandish in her right hand, her face a study in contemptuous fury that powerfully swept before it all trace of pleasure and left nothing but a wave of angry red. What's the matter with you, she hissed. Don't you have any other place to dress? Yeah, 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 he replied, mocking her, but I understood. My father had been bad, and there was something strange about his badness, and my mother was a witch. What the fuck? By itself, that image of her mother might have been sufficient to imbue any relationship with her father with a sense of danger. But a year and a half later, another incident effectively reduced her father to the shadow she remembered. The joyous ritual of the day was lining up with her sisters and brother and waiting expectantly for his kiss on his return from work. On this fateful occasion, just as Norma's turn came, she heard her mother's voice from behind. What's all the kissing? What are you, a kissing bug? You have to kiss them every night? That ended all spontaneous shows of affection by her father and placed any meaningful relationship with him out of bounds. Well, in her defense, he did whip out his pecker in front of his child. The image of the witch brandishing the cooking spoon continued to haunt Norma throughout her life and enforced her mother's prohibition against her relationship with her father and with all men. At one point, after a particularly intense sexual experience, Norma had the distinct impression that the walls had suddenly become paper thin, and this our incarnation of her mother was slowly mounting the stairs to her apartment. In a desperate effort at survival, she dashed across the room and turned on the light. Following that night, she felt she had no choice but to terminate her relationship, and it was many months before she dared to have another one. At the point in her analysis when she gave, again felt ready for a heterosexual relationship, she had a dream that represented an extraordinary condensation of the dynamics of her terror. It actually consisted only of a frightening sound, high-pitched and thin, a blackened smokestack and a kind of kiosk that contained the door to the roof that she, she recalled from her childhood. Her ensuing association summoned forth one terrifying memory after another, ending with her experience at the dentist the previous year. That seems to come closest, she wrote, the feeling of hysteria that I won't manage. It suddenly occurs to me that the prospect of former relationships with a man has always filled me with terror. The kiosk brought back her earliest fantasy from around four and a half of a similar structure that she had presumed was inside her and was continually guarded by a jovial little man, one of the seven dwarfs. Norma had always been too ashamed of what she felt was its abnormality to reveal it to anyone. And only now, when she was clear enough about her real identity, was she able to approach it. Its significance becomes apparent with the realization that the first time her abusive brother took her up to the roof of the building to which they had just moved, she suspected that he might kill her there. The roof became the symbol of death and was represented in her fantasy by the door. To ensure her safety, she selected as guardian to the door the jovial dwarf, whose enduring statue she saw every day in her home. Although that early fantasy vanished along with her need for it, she continued to be haunted throughout her life by the nagging sense of its grotesqueness, which was enhanced by her complete amnesia concerning either its origin or its function. Only now did it become clear that this bizarre perception of what was inside her had been defended her what was inside her had defended her against the terror 
and had guaranteed her safety at all times. Her fantasy also had another unconscious determin determinant, although the roof was an important symbol in Norma's dreams and fantasies, she was aware of its symbolic meaning and expressed surprise when I reminded her that falling off the roof is a common expression for menstruation and represents abortion. The repressed feelings and memories that this particular dream about the roof liberated proved to be the key to her fear and to the central issues of her life. In recalling the fantasy of the incorporated door and the little man who guarded it, she suddenly revived an early image of herself standing in the dark, crowded new apartment to which the family had moved after the death of her brother. She is all alone in the unfamiliar house and gazes out in terror at what seems like acres of furniture. Since she was convinced that she had murdered her brother, she apparently had interpreted it all subsequent experiences in the light of her crime. At the moment of abandonment, when she now assumed her mother had left her to go shopping, her expectation that her mother would retaliate by killing her appeared to have reached the point of realization. In the extremity of her fear, she then created the protective fantasy. It wasn't long after the insight that Norma experienced the terror that terror on a conscious level in relation to her creativity. At one point during her session, while she was reporting her triumphant resumption of painting after one of her periodic setbacks, I caught a note of fear in her voice and commented, you seem scared, to quote from her own account of that session. I was surprised by Block's response, she wrote. Had she not called my attention to it, I mightn't have noted a feeling that was so familiar. I was frightened because I felt she didn't want me to paint. Pursuing it further in answer to her, why not? I arrived at, you don't want me to do anything. And then, you don't want me to live. You want me dead. After a lifetime of searching for his mother's love, Norma finally experienced her terror of being killed by her. The feeling that she projected onto me expressed her unconscious perception of her mother's wishes. Although she had appeared to accept the validity of my early interpretation of her dreams and other communications, until now she had been unable to experience them. Only after she had confronted the reality of her mother's hatred and the hopelessness of her struggle to win her love could she develop a sufficient sense of her real identity to allow her to know the terror that she had defended against since her earliest years. Experience that liberated her from the necessity of maintaining the ingratiating, self-effacing facade that had been her lifelong defense. I mean, in her mother's defense, she had repeated, at least this was stated, that she had repeated miscarriages. So, you know, I don't know if that her mother exactly hated her, but her mother was probably suffering herself. And I mean, this whole thing of her mother hated her and wanted to kill her seems excessive. I mean, considering the circumstances, had she been a normal mother and had no miscarriages, et cetera, et cetera, and children dying, you know, whatever. The sufficient, the suffering experienced by Norma has frequently been referred to as masochism and its motivation, the achievement of pleasure. Theodore Reich summed up the essence and aim of masochism as victory through defeat, stating the masochistic character has expanded its suffering to cover the whole of life. He faithfully believes that misery, humiliation, disgrace will be made up for by what comes afterwards. The afterwards reaches out indefinitely to include the time after death, the prize being future appreciation and the praise of posterity. His concept of victory through defeat comes very close to describing the investment in worthlessness, but his theory of the nature of that victory bypasses an important issue that Freud referred to in 1927 when he stated, there's no doubt that there is something in these people that sets itself against the recovery as though it was were a danger, that the stake in the investment in worthlessness could only be life or death has been brought home to me by my treatment of Norma and of many other patients. I soon learned that any suggestion that Norma was worthwhile or any experience that might imply it could throw her into a panic by indicating that she was not to blame for her mother's hatred of her since she was still convinced that her life depended on her mother's love. Such a suggestion would have exposed the uselessness 
of her struggle to win it and have thus placed her life in jeopardy. It is not possible to measure with any degree of accuracy the Herculean efforts that had commenced in her early childhood and continued throughout her life to promote the illusion that she was unworthy. She had idealized the image of her mother and devalued her self-image in a process that was intended to lay the groundwork for eventually being loved. What might appear on the surface to be a perverse and irrational pattern of behavior and analysis stemmed very logically from her earliest perceptions. Since her life appeared to be to depend on her mother's love, her safety demanded that she maintain a potentially loving image of her. Of her. She therefore tailored her self-image to justify her perception of her mother's negative feelings by establishing her own worthlessness, resting her hope of being loved on the possibility of changing and becoming worthy that the investment in worthlessness is essentially a way of maintaining hope, as Reich implied, was corroborated not only by Norma, but by many patients. The hope goes for far beyond praise or appreciation, however. Whether a child conceived of himself as a giraffe or as a dog that doesn't deserve to be a child, or whether at age 30 or 40 or 50 he flagellated himself, insisting that he was a bastard, a cheap character, that he was bad, worthless, or inadequate, and developed a self-defeating lifestyle to prove it, it becomes evident that he was engaged in the same struggle that Norma's story so dramatically illustrated, to maintain the hope that since his worthlessness had caused his parents to hate him, whenever he changed and became worthy, he would be loved. How little that fantasy is ever allowed to be tested was also established by Norma. Since she unconsciously knew the truth, she had devised a system of self-deception that required the agility of a tightrope walker. If she pr proved beyond a doubt that she was worthy, she would have exposed that she was not to blame for the way her mother felt about her. On the other hand, if she unequivocally established that she was unworthy of her mother's love, she would have lost the last shred of hope, either unqualified success, which exposed her intrinsic worth, or abysmal failure, which destroyed all possibility of becoming worthy, threatened her system of self-deception. At any point in her life that either was demonstrated beyond the shadow of a doubt, she was in danger of committing suicide. She could therefore not allow the conflict to be resolved. She had to trick herself into living. The dual function of Norma's facade to defend against her, to, again, to defend against the fear of being killed and to win love suggests the complexity of the process of liberation. In one of her last entries, she wrote, this is the whole story, that I was a slave and now at last I'm free. The courage that she derived from her new understanding freed her from the need to defeat herself and permitted her creativity to come to the fore. That she had not yet given up the struggle, that underlying all her new productivity was the unconscious fantasy that her efforts would be re rewarded by her mother's love became apparent with each new effort. Survival was still experienced in the terms that had been set in early childhood. Only after her fantasy had been exposed again and again was she able to accept that not only had her worthlessness not caused her mother's hatred and her, wa her wish to kill her, but the proof of her worth would not win her love. Gradually, she was able to abandon her fantasy and the self-deception that, that had made it impossible for her to, to discover either her mother's identity or her own. She was then ready to look elsewhere for love and to approach her search for it with maturity. Whew, that's a fucking convoluted shit there. Chapter 9 awaits the need for a distorted parental image. I need to get the fuck away from this book, personally. Balderdash. Goodbye, bruv. Goodbye.